that to compare some of the real world reservoirs against. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Kathy here to look through some of those. So, good morning. Um, my contribution here will be try to try and demonstrate for you the complexity of the geometry of pore systems within nature. So, although I appreciate this model and its jumping off point uh, for creating the equations, um, let's see what happens in the real world. This is a uh, picture of nugget sandstone. It's commonly known as a quote-unquote clean sandstone, but if you look at this picture, I can see some glaring differences. Um, the size and shapes of the grains are not uniform, therefore the size and shapes of the pores and pore throats will not be uniform. So already we have a conflict with our model. Now if we look at this sandstone in further magnification, this is at uh, 200 power. Our clean sandstone is really not so clean. We have uh, clays that are occluding pore throats, pore spaces, coating grains, um, again, further conflict with our model. And then if we look at it at 2000 power, these are pore bridging illites. They are uh, flow barriers, or can be flow barriers. So again, we have to consider all these things that are occurring in nature when we're using this as our model. I can't change what's in the ground, so my only option is to try and look at what the ground is telling me and change my model. So the same clay can have different morphologies, although it's the makeup of it is the same when you break it down uh, using x-ray diffraction, uh, but it will cause different flow characteristics. So I'm going to show you different ways that illite can present itself in, the, in nature. Uh, this is hairy illite. Um, I don't know if you can see this arrow very well. All these fine fibers, that's the hairy illite. And you can see it's deposited itself right in one of the pores and into this pore space, pore throat space right here. So you can imagine flow coming through this rock, what's going to happen if you have turbulent flow, uh, what's going to happen um, if all those fibers break off and start to migrate. These are uh, Isolated pockets of illite, uh, we can see they're, again, they're not connected to each other, but they're isolated. Again, it's going to have a different effect on the flow pattern. This is detrital illite. Now, um, what are you going to do with that compared to your, your model? Detrital illite, um, orthogenic material is deposited at the time of deposition. So that clay comes in as the other uh, framework minerals are being deposited. Um, so that's, that's this clay. Most other clays are uh, diagenic, so they are due to alteration of rock. So as your uh, erosion and weathering of feldspars, that kind of thing, you, you get additional clays. But, um, so you have to ask yourself, what, what am I dealing with? so I know how to understand what's flowing through this rock. Um, it's not the only one. Uh, this is smectite. Uh, smectite is a freshwater sensitive clay. Um, it's like a deck of cards and as freshwater molecules bulldoze down the deck of cards, I mean the house of cards, um, it's called swelling, which Really, it's the house of cards collapsing on itself, which causes a, a potential formation damage. So we see this here. Um, this is pervasive throughout this particular reservoir rock. These cubes here are dolomite, ROMs, but the clay is occluding all the free spaces. Here, 
the smectite is grain coating here and along these surfaces here. So that adds to just the rugosity of the situation for uh, the pore network. We have uh, two more pictures showing similar um, situations where the smectite is going to cause a fluid flow issue. This is a mature sandstone. This is the Meisner sand. Again, it's thought to be relatively clean. Looking at it next to our model, we see that it's really not so clean. These size and shape of the grains vary. These are the sand grains. That doesn't really match our model. We look at this in 2000 view, we can see the complexity of this clay and the problems that it generates for our, our fluid flow model. And then we have dolomites. So you have this nice model with these wonderful orbs, and then you have dolomite. What are you going to do when your fluid flow has to go around all these sharp edges? All the pore spaces, all the pore throats are extremely complicated compared to your model. Uh, pore throats are different shapes than sandstones. The meniscus shape and the interface energy will be very different. Um, so also, thinking of fluid flow, um, this is a picture of uh, the Bakken shale, so an organic shale. These are expulsion fractures within the shale. Um, these fractures um, are generated as the, as the oil is generated. This is providing the permeability of the system. The matrix itself, um, this, is, this will be the matrix surrounding these fractures. That is not going to provide your permeability for this system. The system's permeability comes from this fracture network. So you can imagine the flow coming through all these interconnected microfine fractures. Again, very different from your model. So I think I, what I'd really like to impress upon you is to know your rock, know your reservoir system, and then adjust your model accordingly. You can't really do that uh, properly if you don't look at your rocks. So reservoir architecture controls the shape of the pore throats, which controls the shape of the meniscus, which controls the energy that's at the interface. Further complication is if we change the energy equilibrium in a reservoir, and that will further complicate our energy and meniscus shape issues. The meniscus has uh, energy equilibrium shape, but if energy non equilibrium occurs, it will distort the shape of the meniscus. Inhibition of the undersaturated phase restores the equilibrium.